This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I have the privilege of cutting off all questions and <laughs> to intro introduce the next speaker. As Tony Hamid said earlier, we're really happy not only that Rick Spinrad is here today, but that he's agreed to speak and on short notice. Although those of you who are familiar with him know that he's so uh, well immersed and uh, cognizant of all the major issues, it probably wasn't that difficult for him, but nonetheless, we appreciate it. He's uh, NOAA's Assistant Administrator for Research. He's also worked uh, extensively at the Office of Naval Research and was Division Director of the Navy's Basic and Applied Research Programs in Ocean, Atmosphere, and Space Modeling and Prediction. Also as Executive Director of the Consortium for Oceanographic Research and Education Corps and Technical Director to the Oceanographer of the Navy. He has very broad experience in marine science, policy and operations, some of the things that Scripps people work in, and perhaps most relevant in a way to a celebration of Roger Revelle's uh, hundred year ago birth is that Rick has spent uh, somewhere over 300 days at sea himself over the years. So please welcome Rick Spinrad. Thank you, Dr. Cicerone, for that uh, wonderful introduction. More importantly, thank you for that extraordinarily eloquent uh, run through on so many complicated issues associated with climate change and CO2, something that I think sets a wonderful stage for many of the other talks we're going to hear today. Let me start by saying that uh, I am truly honored to be here. It also is especially an honor to be here among such an extraordinarily distinguished panel and audience, uh, and a pleasure, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Kennel, especially to see both of you again. And, and let me add that a, a third real honor for me is to be here on this special occasion in which we are honoring Dr. Roger Revelle. Uh, as you uh, heard from Dr. Cicerone, I started my Washington, D.C. career almost a quarter century ago, uh, intending to spend just a couple of years there at the Office of Naval Research, and had the opportunity back then, working, I might point out, for a certain Captain Paul Gaffney at that time as our uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Research, uh, and we would conduct regular visits here to Scripps for site visits, and I had the extraordinary honor on one of those early site visits to spend a little bit of time with Dr. Roger Revelle and share with him his thoughts on the Office of Naval Research. And it makes a nice connection because you just heard from Dr. Cicerone some of the extraordinary work that was performed by Dr. John Martin in terms of iron fertilization work that I would quickly point out was supported by the Office of Naval Research back then. So there's a wonderful set of consequences here that for me have some personal relevance uh, and I am delighted to be able to uh, talk to you a little bit about what I would say is really a national vision for climate products and services uh, but from a NOAA perspective and I'm delighted to be able to uh, build on that from many of the examples and fundamental scientific issues that Dr. Cicerone alluded to. This statement here captures a lot of what we will be talking about here uh, during the rest of the day. We are undertaking an extraordinary experiment. Uh, you saw the experiment characterized in a number of different scientific manifestations in the previous talk. I would argue we just heard, again, in an extraordinary, extraordinarily eloquent way, what are the things we need to understand? You heard about the implications of the role of the oceans, the upper atmosphere, the need to understand projections and predictions, carbon sources and sinks. What I'd like to focus then in my talk is on the why we should care, 
What is it that we will do or that we need to do with this information, these products and services, in benefit to society? And then also spend a little bit of time addressing how we can understand further uh, how these various issues affect the societal implications that I'll talk about. More specifically, I want to talk about how these kinds of products and services that I will address focus into some particular societal benefit areas. And the areas I'll allude to are in economic development. And if you look at the examples called out on the right, you'll see that uh, these run the gamut from energy to uh, transportation, agriculture, uh, a variety of different manufacturing issues of chemistry as well. I'll talk a little bit about safety issues in terms of protection of property and lives. And I'll also talk about, if you will, the parallel issue of environmental stewardship. These represent for us at NOAA uh, three legs of the stool that we see as central to our mission responsibilities. And they wrap into the issue of informing policy makers, decision makers, providing the kind of information necessary to address some of the fundamental issues, such as the geoengineering questions that Dr. Cicerone just alluded to. So what I will do is try to walk through each of these particular areas and give you some sense of the kinds of products and services predicated on the research capabilities you just heard about that will help us address issues of mitigation and adaptation through improved understanding. To do so, let's start with the topic of economic development and look specifically at the issue of marine transportation. I'll have some things to say about broader transportation issues. And this is not a particularly complicated issue when you take into account some of the dramatic changes that we are seeing in the environment, notably in the Arctic. And if you look at what some of the early projections were several years ago about the loss of the summertime Arctic sea ice. About 15 years ago, the general thinking was projections suggest that we could see a summertime ice-free Arctic by the end of this century, by the year 2100. Dramatically, what we are quickly recognizing is that, that those projections are more realistic to occur in a much, more, in a much shorter time period. And in fact, what you see in this lower graph are the projections that came out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2007, Assessment Report 4, using one of the models from our laboratory, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Uh, I would say this is a mid-scenario, that is to say it's not an extreme, suggesting in this case that by late in this century, 2085, we would see a dramatic reduction in sea ice. Since then, of course, we're seeing even more rapid suggestions. What does this mean? Well, as you see in the upper right, uh, this means that we will see opening of many of the key navigation routes, the Northwest Passage, the Northern Sea Route, respectively in the red and the green here, opening up for transportation notably from Asia to Europe and also to South America. Of note, in the last two years, we've seen dramatic reductions in sea ice, uh, arg arguably perhaps anomalous, but dramatic nonetheless. And in 2007, the Northwest Passage was open for 36 days. 36 days for transport of a variety of goods and materials. Now, there's a dramatic reduction in the time to ship from Asia to Europe using this route. Uh, there's a uh, dramatic savings in terms of energy costs. But it begs the question of whether this is to be part of the concept of operations in marine transportation. And it also begs additional questions associated with more with the environmental stewardship, and that is the introduction of additional pollutants from the ships that are transiting in those areas. And then there are subsequent consequences when you look at the uh, introduction of additional carbon in that part of the world from those ships. What are the impacts? What are the feedbacks on the ice itself? There's another important component, and it's tied similarly to the loss of sea ice and that sea level rise. And you saw some of the dramatic uh, indications of sea level rise at over three millimeters per year from Dr. Cicerone's talk. The implications there are rather important as well. Nowadays, when we look at the change in marine transportation, you're looking at draft of typical shippers going back to 1855, 1955, and now these units are feet. We're looking at over 40-foot draft on many of these vessels. And, oh, by the way, under keel clearance for most of these vessels as they come into our major global ports and harbors is typically less than six inches. 
in many cases dragging the bottom. An additional foot of underkeel clearance for a vessel of this size, a Panamax vessel as they're called, can equate to over a million dollars worth of goods to be transported. So you can be guaranteed that the shipping industry is very interested in knowing how large their ships might be in terms of draft and underkeel clearance based on projections from the climate change research community. Let's talk about another issue, and that's the issue of fisheries. Obviously a strong economic driver. Just in the United States alone, this is a $70 billion a year industry. And we've seen some extraordinary changes just in the last few years. On the left, you're seeing some of the, the uh, uh, distributions of uh, hauls and assessments and catches uh, undertaken in a joint Russia-U.S. Uh, Arctic survey that was conducted in 2004. And for the first time, we have seen juvenile pollock in uh, uh, latitudes far northern uh, than ever seen before. Uh, in fact, in many cases, what were Alaska pollock are now Russian pollock. I don't hesitate to point out that there are extraordinary policy implications with respect to regulatory issues. But more importantly, what does this connote with respect to other species? What does it connote with respect to the biogeography of everything from phytoplankton up to the largest fish species, and how are we going to be able to project those kinds of changes in the biogeography and distribution uh, of these uh, economically viable and important species? The related piece, of course, on the land is the agriculture piece, and I'm taking, I'm pulling a fast one on you here, because what I want to try to do is give you a sense of what some of the dramatic changes as a result of changes in global temperatures, precipitation, humidity, might be in agriculture. And I'm using as an analog the very dramatic 97-98 El Nino. And you are seeing here what some of the impacts are from an agricultural perspective worldwide just in terms of crop losses. That's the bright red dots. These others are a variety of other kinds of impacts in terms of uh, famine or in terms of fires and other consequences, but just in the U.S. agricultural sector alone, from the change that you saw earlier was really in the long run just a degree or so globally, we are seeing between one and a half and roughly two billion dollars impact on the agricultural market. This is a consequence of drought, this is a consequence of uh, redistribution of uh, temperature gradients. It's a significant impact on a critical economic sector, obviously. Another economic development area that needs to be attended to, we're all familiar with, is energy. But I would point out it's, uh, it's an interesting mix of both the renewable and non-renewable piece. The argument is we need climate products and services to address all of these. Whether it's in terms of siting a uh, wave or tide uh, generating station in which you're going to have to ask the question of how will the climato climatology of wind fields and wave fields in the world's oceans change under a variety of scenarios and are we positioned well to do that? If we are talking about major solar arrays, how will the cloud patterns and cloud distributions change? And that now begs some very interesting modeling implications with respect to cloud resolving modeling capabilities. An extraordinary thought that we might actually be able to develop. We can't do that now for weather forecasting purposes. How will we be able to do that in terms of climate predictions and projections? But there is also, on the non-renewable side, some interesting implications. Uh, here you're seeing some photographic uh, evidence of methane hydrates right at the surface. More importantly, this image shows you what the distribution of these clathrates, methane hydrates, is throughout the world's <coughs> coastal communities. An extraordinary potential energy supply, will they be de destabilized under different environmental conditions? More importantly, perhaps, you saw a slide from Dr. Cicerone addressing radiative forcing of different greenhouse gases. Recall methane was about a quarter of the radiative forcing of carbon dioxide. What if these are, in fact, released through a variety of changes of environmental conditions? All of these kinds of economic development issues 
beg the need for a wide range of products and services that are predicated on the research we just heard about. But it goes beyond economic development. It's into our responsibilities for environmental stewardship. And here we get into some uh, truly extra extraordinary issues. And the ones that, in fact, are starting to serve as the situational awareness raising issues, those issues that the public now recognizes, the kinds of issues that are making it to the front pages of papers, the kinds of issues that folks here uh, at Scripps, uh, Vicki Fabry, Dick Feely at our lab and PMEL are putting a lot of effort in. And it is understanding the ocean acidification issue, how widespread is it, what specifically is the biogeochemistry associated with ocean acidification, what can we expect down the line. And there are a number of interesting findings. You're looking at coccolithophores grown in the lab here under a variety of different, uh, if you will, CO2 pressures equivalent to uh, actually a little below where we are right now. Recall we're at about 385 parts per million. Uh, what if that does get up to the 780 to 850? We see extraordinary decreases in calcification. I don't need to explain to this audience the trophic interactions and consequences when you start literally eroding the primary productivity in a particular area. But I'd also point out that it's not limited, obviously, to calcifiers like coccolithophores. Uh, pteropods suffer the same consequences. Pteropods serve as a major food source for North Pacific juvenile salmon. So we could see immediate consequences with respect to commercially viable species in our fisheries world. Part of the ecosystem impacts gets to truly understanding what the whole nature of the ecosystem is. And you hear a lot about ecosystem-based management. And as a physical oceanographer, I can tell you that I was trained about the conveyor belt circulation purely from a physics perspective. That is, you've got the warmer waters shown in red as part of the global circulation cooling, thermohalo, thermohaline circulation driving them deeper to recirculate them back out to the Pacific. Well, it's not quite that simple. And oh, by the way, this obviously has implications for the ecosystems that depend on distribution of nutrients, that depend on thermal structure. And so we've now recognized that we really need a good predictive capability. One of the products and services that we should look at is our ability to understand how this conveyor belt, which I would argue is more like a highly elastic slowing and starting conveyor belt that's moving all over the ocean, is really defining how the ecosystems work. Part of the way we're going to get there is through the use of new techniques like the Argo uh, float array, ascending down to about one or 2,000 meters, drifting for a few days, then rising to the surface and reporting back their temperature profile, other uh, observations, and giving you some sense of how the, the surface ocean is circulating and what the surface temperature is. And in fact, this work couldn't have happened without the extraordinary efforts of Russ Davis and Peter Neeler and Dean Remick here at Scripps. There was, in fact, a quote in last week's New York Times from Dean Remick that said, measuring ocean temperature is the best way to measure global warming. And I would argue using the Argo array to do that will give us the understanding of what this kind of circulation pattern looks like. And that will be a key factor to understanding the ecosystem that is the whole surface ocean. A much more immediate implication in environmental stewardship comes down to, in our case at NOAA, our responsibilities for place-based management. These are our nation's national marine sanctuaries scattered around the globe in U.S. territories. Uh, you may be familiar with some of these. California has four off your coasts here. Here's the question for you. Just like Yellowstone National Park, which is a place-based managed area, what happens if the place changes? What happens if the grizzly bears and all the flora and fauna for which Yellowstone National Park is known move out of Yellowstone National Park? Well, we have exactly that situation here. And it does beg the question, then, about managed protected areas and how we manage them in terms of how the ecosystem is going to change. So the roles that we've got as good environmental stewards for assessing and protecting certain areas have got to be based on more than just where they are. They've got to be based on the particular ecosystem and how that, in, fight, in fact, might change. Let me switch gears a little bit and talk about the safety issue of protection of property and lives. And in order to do so, 
I want to share with you uh, a piece of information. One of the advantages of working in the Department of Commerce is that our sister agency is the Bureau of Census. So we have access to some extraordinary bits of information. And what you're seeing here uh, is the growth in population in uh, all of the counties in the United States. The green ones are the non-coastal ones, and then the reds, oranges, and pinks are the coastal ones. And even just on a quick look, you can see that over the last three decades, there was extraordinary growth in the coastal communities. Couple this, and, and I would point out there are also some fascinating statistics I won't get into here about the demographics of that growth, and it's fair to say that because of economic development, these tend to be some of the wealthier counties as well. So the values of properties are inordinately high as well. Now you couple that with the preponderance of events, hurricanes. This is a, obviously not a single shot, but an aggregate from 2005. <laughs> Although for those of you who lived in the Gulf, you might have thought it was one shot. Uh, we've got Rita and Katrina and the rest of them there. Uh, these are some of the assessments of susceptibility to sea level rise just in the uh, Mississippi uh, River area. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. We're talking, of course, about what are the consequences of climate change with respect to tropical cyclones, tropical storms. Uh, we believe that it's reasonably fair to state that we will see more intense Atlantic hurricanes. Now, I've just limited that to Atlantic hurricanes because the jury's still out with respect to what's going to happen in the Pacific. These are not insignificant. Over the last 10 years globally, some 480,000 people have been killed and two and a half billion people have had their lives significantly affected by these kinds of, uh, these kinds of events. In monetary value, we're looking just in the uh, uh, U.S. alone at something in the neighborhood of $690 billion dollars or as we from Washington these days like to say, roughly one stimulus unit of damage. <laughs> I'd, I'd point out also that it's, um, it, it's not the immediate direct effects alone. Shishmaref, Alaska is suffering some extraordinary consequences. Shishmaref uh, up on the North Slope used to be ice bound by December every year. They are not now. And as a consequence, the early winter storms are making a direct hit on the population. Uh, 18 homes have been relocated. One was completely lost uh, on a per capita basis. That's an extraordinary number when you look at a town the size of Shishmaref. Other kinds of human health issues, harmful algal bloom forecasting. We are just getting to the capability right now of being able to develop effective forecasts for harmful algal blooms based in large part on having species-specific ocean color models that allow us to characterize the initial concentrations, in this case off the Florida shelf, of the species Karenia brevis, and then having adequate forecasts of winds. Karenia K. brevis causes respiratory problems, so if we've seen the ocean color images and we know what's, uh, what the bloom looks like and can translate that into concentrations, we also have observations of, of uh, winds offshore. We can actually tell the folks in Tampa, St. Pete, in the public health community right now, you got about three days before you're going to see an extraordinary peak in admissions from people with respiratory problems. We only have that one system right now because it's specific to K. brevis. We have issues here on the west coast. In the northeast, you may remember there was an Alexandrian bloom a uh, couple of years ago that caused devastating damage. How are we going to be able to, what products and services will we need? in a changing climate in order to improve our forecast capability. We already know we're seeing increased frequencies of harmful algal blooms. What will happen under changing conditions? The other example, of course, that many people are familiar with is the uh, increase in, uh, potential increase in vector-borne diseases. And the IPCC has noted that the global population at risk from vector-borne malaria will increase, will increase by between 200 and 400 million in the next century, and that's malaria alone. There's another one, and air quality forecast similarly. IPCC had reported in 2007 that respiratory disorders may be exacerbated, again, because of the heat, because of the drought, because of the increased potential for aerosols to get introduced into the air, not to mention some of the potential ozone consequences. So air quality, vector-borne diseases, harmful algal blooms, a lot of these kinds of things are addressable, and our ability to predict and forecast these 
is going to be based on research and development of a set of operational products and services. It's not limited to these. I thought I'd take a minute and just talk about something that's near and dear to Southern California. This one's a triple whammy. It's a triple whammy for, three re for, for the following reasons. The increased population density in uh, vulnerable areas is one factor, and we're starting to see homes being built in areas where they may not have been built before. Uh, I've got vacation property up in Bend, Oregon. I can tell you there are, they are building in areas there in the high desert where 20, 30 years ago never, nobody would have ever thought to build. Those are fire-prone areas. Uh, the other is the forecasted and projected changes in wind and humidity and the general conditions that portend vulnerability for wildfires. Uh, my own deputy, Sandy McDonald, lives in Boulder, Colorado. On January 7th of this year, January 7th, high winds, over 100 miles an hour, dry conditions came down from the front range, knocked down power lines. It was so dry, wildfires started out on January 7th in Boulder, Colorado, threatened his home. It was extremely unusual. Is that the trend we're going to see in the future? And the third factor in this triple whammy, which is a fascinating one, is the migration of the vegetative fuels as a consequence of climate change. We are already seeing that in Southern California. Tropical flora are moving further north and they serve as a better fire fuel than the previously existing flora. How can we build the models, how can we build the projections to allow for a better forecast? Uh, Dan Kayen has supported uh, a number of these efforts of other Scripps researchers and in fact has provided some of the first effective wildfire forecasts for the western U.S. in the last couple of years. I want to stress it's not just about the operational capability though, which is what I've spent a lot of time talking about here, it's also about policy improvement. And policy improvement has been alluded to in uh, some of what you've heard thus far. The uh, eponymous healing curve that we've heard about already and I suspect we'll see more of in the future, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is the quintessential observational capability. And what I'm talking about in policy here really is about observations, models, and assessments. On the observation side, uh, to me, in fact, uh, and I've heard others say, the Keeling curve is, is kind of like a mix of the Rosetta Stone, the Dow Jones, and your cholesterol count. It's <laughs> A Rosetta Stone because it gives us an extraordinary translating tool to what happened in the past. As Dr. Cicerone pointed out, our way of looking back at what happened in previous ice ages can be connected through these kinds of observations. It's a Dow Jones in the sense, not in the sense of what the Dow's doing now, but in the sense that Dow Jones is a singular index of a variety of different factors. And I think if you got anything out of Dr. Cicerone's talk, you recognize that the CO2 observations at Mauna Loa are a blend of a variety of different processes that are going on in the earth. And it's like the cholesterol count because everybody uses that as a health indicator. It's something everybody agrees to as a way of assessing. It's not perfect, it's not the only one, but it's something that everybody uses and people now are starting to use this. I have found waiters and waitresses and taxi cab drivers who understand what 385 parts per million carbon dioxide means. That's extraordinary. It's the same people who probably 20 years ago didn't know what their cholesterol count was. So on the observation side, we need to sustain this for policy support. Here in California, you've got an analog on the wet side, and that, of course, is Cal Coffee. Over uh, half a century of observations of standard lines offshore of a variety of different coastal phenomena. Those kinds of observations must be sustained. The, uh, the second piece is the models and model resolution. Here you see, in fact, the product. It's the same model I showed you earlier from the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab. It's a projection of surface air temperature change. Uh, in fact, it's the same projection you saw in a slightly different format from Dr. Cicerone's presentation. The models continue to provide the best guesses, the best assessments of what the future changes will be based on predictions of current state or projections, the what ifs, what if we double CO2, what if we stop emitting right now. And then the final piece, of course, is putting this into reports that can be provided to the decision makers. And what you see here are some of the extraordinary products from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
Uh, that panel included over 2,500 scientists, including dozens here at Scripps, uh, and was half of the Nobel Peace Prize last year, along with Al Gore. What I've talked about then is what's been fed into some of the general intergovernmental policy activities. But quite honestly, uh, when you go talk to the municipal officials, when you talk to local governments, when you talk to the governing bodies in La Jolla and San Diego, they're going to want, want to know, what does it mean for me? And so this represents one of the extraordinary developments over the last few years. It's the development of the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program, RESAs. Nine of them around the country. In fact, Dan Cahan here directs the NOAA-funded uh, CAP, California Applications Program, working with the California Climate Change Center. This structure, as you can see, basically allows us to say, let's take the models and the observations that I just talked about, translate that into the specific interests of a, of a region. In the Gulf of Mexico, they may be very interested in implications, say, for the Gulf shrimp fishery. Uh, in California, there's going to be specific interests, as it shows here, in things like forest fires, drought, human health, water resource management. This gives us a way of getting not just the questions from the local municipalities, but also translating what can sometimes be some overwhelming scientific results into products and services for the community. And in fact, uh, Dr. Kahn and Dr. Michael Dettinger from CAP were among some of the recipients of the California Department of Water Resources' first ever awards for climate science services based on their work in this regard. These are the things that are out there now. I'll spend just a minute in closing talking about the things that are emerging. This is an exciting one. We found out that in spite of all of these observations and all of the best models, we didn't have a way of telling people where are the sources and sinks in atmospheric carbon dioxide. So developing a system that creates a three-dimensional geographical and temporal estimate of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is what was done uh, at our laboratory in Boulder. And if you want to play with it, we've provided the URL down here. The, uh, the product can show you over time, based on roughly 100 observations around the globe for CO2, the best interpolative models and the best visualization techniques, how are sources and sinks changing? Very important for two reasons. One is to establish the terms for what I would say are the emerging carbon economy policies, whether it's cap and trade, whether it's carbon tax, whether it's AB 32 in California. How can we start looking at what are the appropriate levels of CO2? And do we have geographic variances we need to take into account? The other aspect of this is what I would call the equivalence to treaty verification. Just like with every other international treaty, you want to be able to verify how it's being carried out. With tools like this, you'll be able to look and see if we set a cap, if we set some understanding about what carbon emissions should be, is that really the way it's playing out? And oh, by the way, what are the implications of what's happening in the U.S. on Europe or in Asia on the U.S.? The other piece of this that's really, I think, a fundamental breakthrough is going from taking what I would argue are the esoteric visualization tools that we as scientists use to the ones the public has become so familiar with. And I'm delighted to have worked with uh, Tony and Jane Lubchenco and a number of people uh, at Google in uh, helping Google roll out its Google Earth 5.0, or GE 5.0, as they call it in Mountain View, which includes a Google Ocean component. Now we can start taking these seemingly esoteric products and put them in a way that anybody who knows how to use Google Earth can start looking at the data and information. Really extraordinary. The other thing I'd like to say is that it's not just about research into policy, just like it's not just about research to operations. It's also policy to research. The National Integrated Drought Information System is an, an extraordinary story in which the Western Governors Association and other groups convinced Congress that Congress need, U.S. Congress needed to pass a law to establish this system, a system that would provide early warnings for drought, that would help establish quality control for the data that are embedded into the models, 
that would give information to decision makers on risk and impact of drought, would give some of the climatology and history of past droughts, managing the impacts of droughts, and basically provide a forum for a variety of different stakeholders. This exists now as a result of the policy folks, the Western Governors Association, saying we need this product. And there is now, in fact, a portal. It's not noaa.drought.gov. It's drought.gov. It's where all of the government products, local, federal, uh, state, are provided to address these issues and provide the kind of uh, solutions I talked about. There are many other policy issues. I don't have time to go into them. You actually heard about some of them for which the research to policy, or research to policy and policy to research continuum is critical. Ocean iron fertilization is probably one of the hottest. We have got to have that connection and seamless dialogue between the policy community, the research community, the regulatory community to ensure that what we are developing is consistent with the best science, that the products and services provided by the science help to solve the policy issues and advise most importantly. In sum then, what I've tried to do in this talk is tell you why we need to understand and invoke a couple of the aspects of how. Whether it's observations such as CO2 at Mauna Loa or satellite observations of Arctic sea ice, embedding them into a variety of different models such as the IPCC models and visualization schemes like Carbon Tracker to provide real products and services for decision makers and for establishing uh, a better lifestyle that can improve economic development, that can ensure environmental stewardship, and that can save us, protect our lives and property. I have a final slide. I'm not going to read this because last night what I realized that I'll let you read this. I'm going to read you something else very briefly. Uh, and it comes from my having been asked to do this a couple of days ago. And it goes like this, quote, now our country must rise to a new challenge, dealing with the impacts of the changing climate. In my work, I heard firsthand from businesses and state and local governments about the need for better information and predictions about the impacts of climate change in communities all across this country. From concern about droughts and sea level rise to changes in the chemistry of the ocean, there is real hunger for more and better information. If confirmed, I will work to create a national climate service within NOAA to synthesize the scientific data on climate change and create products and services that can be used by the public to guide important decisions such as where to build a road or wind turbines. This idea has been studied by the agency, the National Academy of Sciences, and by members of this committee. It is an idea whose time has come, and I would like to make it happen. Dr. Jane Lubchenco before the Senate Commerce Committee February 12th of this year, and I've got to believe that if Roger Ravel were there in the audience, he would have stood up and applauded when he heard that. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to introduce the Secretary for Natural Resources for the State of California, Secretary Mike Chrisman. And since his appointment to the Natural Resources Agency by Governor Schwarzenegger in 2003, he has provided the leadership and clear direction for the state's work on ocean and coastal resources. Now, I had some notes from Scripps, and they were all about oceans, but I, as, because I work with Mike on a lot of different issues, I have to highlight that he, his portfolio is very broad. His agency covers water management, and of course, we're in a drought right now, so that is a huge responsibility. His agency covers fire protection with CAL FIRE, and those of you who live in San Diego know the burden of fire on the state of California, and Mike leads the agency with CAL FIRE. He has the Department of Fish and Game. He has the Energy Commission. I'm not going to list all the parts of his agency. I'm sure I would leave some out, but I just want you to know how broad and how important that portfolio is. But on oceans, some of the things Secretary Christman has led the work on include the Governor's Ocean Action Plan, the California Marine Life Protection Act, 
the West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health. And lastly, he is the chairman of California's Ocean Protection Council. And um, just in closing, I want to say as someone, somebody in Sacramento who has the privilege of working with Secretary Chrisman, every citizen of California is lucky that he is in charge of protecting the state's natural resources. So please welcome Secretary Mike Chrisman. Thank you, Cindy. That was very nice. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank, thank you all. I'd like to and particularly thank Scripps and Tony Hammett and the team here at Scripps for the, for the invitation to be here. This is a very, very special day. And as I not only look in this building, uh, look what the Scripps families provided again to the, to the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, but you look up, you look around these buildings and the tremendous amount of history associated with the work here today. Of course, we remember Dr. Ravel for his accomplishments in ocean and in climate uh, studies and, of course, his vision for creation of the University of California at San Diego campus. I'd like to highlight, as I kind of build into some of my comments surrounding the work that we're doing in oceans, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, uh, some of the great strides we've taken uh, to, to continue Dr. Ravel's legacy. He really did understand uh, the challenges of thinking really outside of the box. Those of you who had the privilege of knowing him and working with him know that. Uh, and, 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 taking, and, and essentially saying, taking no risks, we're never going to be making any progress. He once said, and I love this, I love this, it seems to be a requirement that to be a director of the Scripps Institution, one has to be a visionary with grandiose ideas and implausible plans. Uh, it's, really, it's really been true of a whole series of the Scripps directors. I'm privileged, of course, to know firsthand that the scientific leadership that this uh, great institution uh, provides has really helped pave the way for marine research uh, being conducted throughout, of course, California and throughout the, the world. Many of you know that the state of California relationship with Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, dates back more than a century. Back in 1904, Governor George Pardee expressed the interest uh, in a small marine research station that eventually became Scripps. And of course, in the 1940s, we partnered with Scripps and the federal government to establish the California Cooperative Ocean Fisheries Investigations, better known as CalCoffee, to help solve issues associated with the crash of sardines. Even then, Dr. Ravel made visionary statements about the complexity of these issues regarding particularly around sardines. He beat the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy by more than 50 years when he stressed that a more comprehensive approach uh, that considers multiple species and factors would be even more beneficial than the single species investigation we were used to then. In 1947, he said, quote, the sardines cannot be treated as isolated organisms living in a vacuum. The investigation must be integrated, in, uh, one in which proper weight is given not only to the currents and other aspects of the physical environment, but also to the entire organic assemblage, including plants and animals, which form the food chain for the sardines their competitors for the food supply, and the predators, including man. Dr. Ravel's statement, of course, set the tone for the future uh, and highlighted the critical role of science and the whole work of ecosystem-based management. State of California uh, and the leaders at Scripps Institution of o Oceanography agree that science, of course, has got to be the foundation uh, for our ocean and coastal protection and coastal public policy. In many ways, uh, this philosophy and the relationship between science and management was cultivated right here uh, by Dr. Ravel. And as one of the keynote speakers at the first California and Rural Oceans Conference, chaired by Governor Pat Brown back in 1964, emphasized the need to, uh, for science to inform management. California's current ocean and coastal initiatives and projects would not be possible without, of course, the strong science support that we have. In fact, they wouldn't be successful at all, and I think we all know that. Governor Schwarzenegger, since taking office, has, has made ocean protection 
and the management of our ocean resources a top priority from day one. He released the California Ocean Action Plan on the shores of Carmel, uh, at, Carmel at Port Lobo State Park in September of 2004. This was the first of a comprehensive state plan in the nation to address key concerns raised by the United States Commission on Ocean Policy and the Pew Oceans Commission. The plan set forth 13 action items, most of which we've completed. One of the more important of those action items was the included a plan was to enact the California Ocean Protection Act. As a part of that act, we established the California Ocean Protection Council. As Cindy indicated to you in her introduction to me, I have the privilege of serving as that chair, along with uh, Linda Adams, the secretary for Cal EPA, uh, the chair of the State Lands Commission, uh, executive director of the Port of Los Angeles, Geraldine Natz, former mayor of San Diego, Susan Golding, and we have two legislative representatives as ex officio members who are very active in the, in the work that we do. To date, at the Ocean Protection Council, we've invested more than $30 million to support innovative projects for ocean and coastal protection and management in this great state. Our focus is not, not, found, uh, not to fund just good projects, but to fund the most efficient, the most effective, and innovative approaches that will set the course of future of the, for the future of our oceans. The governor, the legislature, and the people of California certainly recognize the importance of this work and have stepped up uh, the plate by, uh, by approving a number of bond funds uh, to ensure that the critical work that we're about is, is, will be completed. As many of you know, uh, this last December, the Pooled Money Investment Board voted to spend, suspend bond funding for the state projects. However, now that the budget plan has, 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 has passed, our state's deficit uh, has, has been addressed in terms of a long-term plan. We're hopeful that the bond, the bond funding is going to resume soon so we can get on with making these projects a reality. Among many, among many of the uh, innovative projects that we, that we uh, have, the state of California's one uh, funds, is, one is the Coastal Oceans Current Monitoring Program. The goal of this multi-institutional interagency collaboration is to achieve integrated monitoring on surface currents uh, on the, along our coast. The program always uh, allows managers to track the trajectories of pollutants like the oil that was done, that was, that was uh, spewed from the Costco Busan in November of 2007 on San Francisco Bay. The Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System is a critical component to the statewide program, which includes many several Scripps scientists. Another practical program specific to Scripps, of course, is the Coastal Data Information System. These, of course, are all followed by, uh, by little acronyms that I, I, won't, I won't bother to give you. Most, most of you who work in this arena know it. It's, they tend to be confusing over time. But the, but the Coastal Data Information System is funded by the California Department of, Par Department of Boating and Waterways and the Army Corps of Engineers. This program provides, re provides real-time data and wave predictions. Thousands of surfers and fishermen and recreational boaters and commercial mariners visit the CDIP website during the high wave events. This is a tremendous public service, plays a key role in, in some of our on-the-water safety programs. Another really important priority of the governor's uh, uh, ocean action plan is, is the implementation, full implementation of the California Marine Life Protection Act. This is an act that mandates that California create a series of marine protected areas in the state waters along the 1,100 mile of coastline here in California. This MLPA process is really unprecedented in the level of stakeholder involvement from the regional stakeholder groups to statewide interest groups to numerous ways for the public to engage very proactively in this process. After exhaustive scientific review, stakeholder meetings, and public uh, hearings, a Blue Ribbon Task Force makes recommendations to the California Fish and Game Commission that then designates marine protected areas along our coastline. In September of 2007, a network of 20, 29 marine protected areas uh, went into effect along the central coast from Pigeon Point to Point Conception. And building on this very successful uh, model, the task force made, re made its recommendation regarding MPAs on the north central coast study region this last summer. The State Fish and Game Commission uh, should be making the final decisions for this North Central Coast in the next few months. And many of you are, I'm sure, also aware in this part of the world that 
the work on the South Coast Study region, that being the point from Point Conception, just north of Santa Barbara, south to the Mexican border is now well underway. In fact, uh, I had the privilege last week of attending one of the stakeholder coordinating group meetings and Blue Ribbon Task Force meetings in Santa Barbara and it's really going well and it's, it's good to see the public involvement, it's good to see the stakeholder involvement in this process and really stakeholders working hand in hand with the scientific community to bring about good public policy that will have significant impacts on the ocean resource and the economy of the state of California. I'm really pleased that Dr. Paul Dayton from Scripps is participating in the science advisory team along with a group of world-class scientists. After the South Coast Study Region, the MLPA implementation will move to the North Central Coast Region, from Alder, that being from Alder Creek north to the, to the Oregon border. And finally, the MLPA planning process will move to the waters within San Francisco Bay. Our goal is to have the com a complete network of MPAs off the California coast by 2011. I can assure you that indeed is a top priority for the governor. The Ocean Protection Council uh, is using a, the California Ocean Science Trust to provide a focal point for providing scientific advice to the council. Scripps Director Tony Hamet, former director Charlie Kennel also served on the trust board for several years. Russ Mall from the California Sea Grant recently served as its chair. Dr. Hamet now serves as the, on, uh, on the new science advisor panel for the trust, which is helping to assure that the Ocean Protection Council has a science-based approach for managing, uh, for management and for funding our resources. The trust um, uh, advice, uh, provides advice on a number of efforts such as uh, monitoring marine protected areas, evaluating issues with invasive species, mapping the bathymetry of the state waters, uh, guiding, uh, guiding studies of the potential impacts of the benefits of offshore oil and gas platform decommissioning alternatives off our coast. Both the United States Commission and the, Commu and the Pew Commission call for more regional approaches uh, to ocean and coastal management. In order to enhance regional relationships, uh, as you heard, California is working with our neighbors in the Oregon and Washington to ensure adequate protection management of our shared waters off our coast. In September of 2006, Governor Schwarzenegger, along, along with Governor Ted Kulongowski of, of, of Oregon and Governor uh, Chris Gregoire of, of Washington, signed the West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health. This agreement commits the three states to work together to improve the health of the oceans. The California current runs off the coast of all three states, and this plan will help the states address our ecosystem management concerns collaboratively and uh, certainly on a regional basis. The three governors released their action plan this last July. This plan contains 26 individual action items to address the most urgent issues off of the West Coast. From climate change adaptation to polluted runoff to preventing marine invasive species, the three states are committed to working together. In the next few months, the governors will be releasing work plans for specific on-the-ground implementation. And finally, under the governor's leadership, California is a leader in the race to curb global warming and to protect California's economic and environmental resources. The governor took bold action when he signed into law AB 32, our, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. This law, as many of you know, commits the state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, to, to 1990 levels by the year 2020 a 25 percent reduction under the business as usual estimates. These efforts are now being led uh, by the climate action team established by the governor to get this job done. More than ever before we must take steps to address the climate uh, impacts not just on our own states and countries but around the world and we're, we are doing that. Our responses to climate change are not simple choice between mitigating greenhouse gas emissions or adapting to its impact. Adaptation and mitigation have to complement one another in order to effectively tackle these challenges uh, that's changing the climate all over the world. That's why in November of 2008, Governor Schwarzenegger called California's first statewide climate change adaptation led by the Natural Resources Agency. Given the serious threat, to, uh, threat of sea level rise and other climatic impacts to California's water supply and coastal resources, the adaptation plan is the first comprehensive step identifying the state's most at-risk areas. We hope to have this plan complete this year. And I want to take a time to mention that Dr. Uh, Dan Cahan and his team here at Scripps has been instrumental in helping us 
understand the impacts of climate change here in California. They're working with us to develop some, uh, some climate change uh, uh, work in this area of adaptation. We want to thank them for that, thank them for their help. So as you can see, designing marine protected areas or preparing for the impacts of climate change, the integration of science into our efforts and management is key. Dr. Ravel and certainly Scripps Institution Oceanography have played very, very important leadership by supplying the robust scientific information to help us manage these resources. I'd like to thank you all for this. I'd like to thank you for taking the time. I'd like to congratulate Scripps for their continued leadership in this area. Nice to be here.